But I thought it would be better to do it for whatever time we could than to, than to cancel. OK. Um, so you remember we had uh, our action, which was sp, which is equal to 2p times integral square uh, d p plus 1 x square root of, and then there was gmn plus uh, bmn plus 2 pi alpha prime Now, um, and there was an e to the power minus one. What is this TP? TP is the tension of the defense. One of our goals will be so We will try to say here. Okay. Uh, if you think of this in the case of the, uh, of, uh, of the uh, number go to action, it was one over two pi alpha pi. But you know this is not the one that you could have told it. Okay. So first, the question, you know, what we're writing down here is a, a sort of low energy vector action, and I will explain to you as we go along what terms we ignore. But let's take these things one by one. First, let's switch off this and this. No B, no G. Okay. So then, this is TP times square root D P plus one, uh, e to the power minus five, net GMN. Why is this the action for this object? Well, this is the same reason that it was the action for the fundamental bridge. It's simply the lowest dimensional object you can write down is the area of the world volume of this guy. You can write down more generally for where it takes you on the extrinsic curve if you want to do things like that, but they're always a more delicate. So if we're interested in the action at lowest order and derivative, that's what this action is going to be. It's going to be the action in the derivative of this action. Okay? So we're interested in the action in the lowest order and derivatives. Okay? Then then this quantity here is clearly the lowest order action that you could write down. Okay, so it's a reasonable thing to have. Okay, now the next thing we're going to ask is, okay, this sounds very reasonable. What sounds funny, what you might not have seen before, is like this echo. Let's stick to B equals zero. Suppose B is zero, where does this T pi extend in from? This also you can understand uh, very simply from what we already know uh, from T duality. Okay. Um, in order to understand this, first let's look at let let's look first at, at an example. Consider that we've got a two torus. So we've got x one and x two. Okay, such that x one, uh, let's call it x capital X two, x one and x two, such that capital X one is equal to two pi uh, x one plus two pi r one. R one is the radius of the first guy. And x2 is equal to x2 plus 2 pi r2. Star 2 is the radius of the second guy. Okay. Now we're on a torus. Okay. And so we can ask, what are the allowed gauge fields on a torus? Now all of you know that the allowed gauge fields on a torus are quantized fields. The are quantized such that the flux of the gauge field around the torus is quantized to units of can somebody tell me why fluxes of gauge fields on a torus are quantized in units of 2 pi? Which thing follows through from the single valuedness of uh, the wave function? Basically follows from single valuedness of wave functions, that's yeah. absolutely right. And one way of thinking of it is that, you know, when you're on a torus, you have to specify boundary conditions. Yeah. Okay? So what you do is to specify what your boundary conditions are uh, you have to specify that the boundary conditions here are something times the boundary condition here. <coughs> now that something has to be a gauge transformation. Yeah. So that the field is physically well defined. Yeah. And all the transformation to the pi i n. No, the gauge transformation may be a non-trivial gauge transformation. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. But all yeah. the, all yeah. gauge invariant quantities yeah. have to be well defined. Gauge variant quantities is different. Right. Okay? So one picture is one, and the other picture is the other, that's fine. But there are some
some gauge transformation, let's call it alpha of x1 that relates here to here. And similarly, there is another gauge transformation set, this one, let's call it beta of x2 that relates here to here. Okay, so let us say it more clearly. Suppose I've got a field phi of charge one. Then we put the boundary conditions at phi of, um, let's say that we're at the point uh, x1 and uh, uh, 2 pi r2, x2 is 2 pi r2. That has to be equal to e to the power i alpha 1, alpha of x1, uh, pi of x1 times 0. Right, this is the boundary condition for this circuit to this one. And similarly, there's another boundary condition going that way. That boundary condition is pi of uh, 0 uh, x2, sorry, no, 2 pi r1. 2 pi r1, uh, x2 is equal to i beta of x1, uh, x2, pi of 0 x2. Okay. Now, these two, these alpha and betas are not completely independent of each other. They're not completely independent of each other. Why not? Because this guy, okay, tells you, wh what this tells you is that, what we can do is try to relate this point here yeah. to this point here. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you can go either this way and this way, or this way and this way. Okay, so suppose we first go this way and this way. So this way we get uh, beta of zero. So pi of, uh, you know, I'm calling it two pi to pi. That's an R1, R2. Is equal to e to the power i beta of zero. Okay, and then plus alpha of two pi R1 times pi zero zero, but it's also equal to e to the power i alpha of zero uh, plus beta of two pi r two <coughs> pi zero zero. So it must be that these two are the same. Or uh, gauge trans. I mean, no. Yeah, I mean, it's up to integers. Yeah. Exactly. Now, uh, up to integer. Up exactly. to 2 pi. Because, uh, up to 2 pi. Because we want well-defined boundary conditions. Yeah. Just the fact that it's a well-defined thing we're saying. Yeah. We're not, not even talking about the gauges right. you know, periodically. Just that it's a well-defined rule right. relating here to here. Tells us that those two must be equal or equal up to e to the power 2 pi. Yeah. So that it must be that beta of 0 plus alpha of 2 pi r1 is equal to alpha of 0 plus beta of 2 pi r2, two pi r2 plus 2 pi n. Uh, or you, you don't plus, want to. Plus, you're right. 2 pi t. Okay? But now look. This, this quantity here, this alpha, is related to the integral of a this a. way. Yes. Because we can get rid of alpha by turning on a gauge field, by doing a gauge transformation. Yes. So that will turn, turn the information of alpha into integral of A. Yes. Okay? And so this quantity here is actually the integral of A the clo yeah, close the over integral. such a loop. Yes. Because you see, yeah. we got alpha of zero yeah. plus beta of two pi r minus alpha of two pi r that's going down. Yeah. Minus beta of zero that's going this way. Yes. But that by Stokes theorem is the flux. Is the flux of the door. Okay, you can say it a little more carefully. So this is the basic idea. <coughs> and therefore it follows that uh, integral f on the torus must be equal to 2 pi n. So the integral of the gate the flux of the torus is quantized in units of 2 pi. 
Since the integral of alpha over the, uh, but therefore integral on two is two pi r one times two pi r two, so it's equal to alpha times two pi r one times two pi r two. Okay, so this has to be equal to two pi times n. It must be that alpha has nothing to do with the previous alpha, right? Which alpha? Which alpha?
Thank you. <laughs> because when we, you know, mathematician when talking about a torus would uh, would would uh, would have a four coordinate charts, hmm. and that's how he he or she would do it properly. For physicists, we know that the effect of that is just by boundary conditions. Right? So we get away with one one coordinate chart, but with appropriate boundary conditions. So doing it really well would be to put yeah. your four coordinate charts, but that's too much work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let's excellent. So now we have this nice uh, th we have this nice little flux. Okay, we have this nice little flux here, and uh, we've got this gauge field. But there is something in. now. What we're going to do is t-dualize this configuration. Okay, but let let us see if we remember remember right. Last time we had concluded that integral a over the sphere uh, over the circle okay that mapped to the fractional position on the circle so so if we have some integral a is equal to let's say little a over a circle after we t-dualize it maps to the position of the d-brain on the circle and what was the precise map the precise map was, you see, this integral A could run from um, um, uh, 0 to 2 pi. So the precise map was that it, it was A times 2 pi r tilde, uh, so sorry, uh, A times r tilde on the circle. Okay, so let me see. Suppose we've got two pictures. <coughs> on one side, we've got some holonomy, and its integral is A. On the other side, we've got a circle. And we've got some location. Let's say its position is x. Okay. Then the relationship was that x was equal to a times r tilde, where r tilde is the radius yeah. on the t-dualized side, and r was the radius here. Yeah. Yeah. All good. Now let's work. Let's t-dualize this configuration, sort of fiber-wise, in the sense that as far as the x1 part is going, we t-dualize that part x2 by x2. You may wonder, worry, worry whether that's exactly okay. Turns out it is. Forget about it. Okay, so we just t-dualize this sort of fiber ways. Okay, so what is the holonomy? Um, in this case, we've got an A2. So what is the holonomy? In, so all these should be for the second direction. So what is the holonomy in the two direction? as a function of x1. Well, the holonomy in the two direction, the holonomy, this integral of a, a around the two direction, h of x1, I'll call it, or integral of a2 as a function of x1. This is integral in the two direction, but any, any fixed x1 is equal to whatever a2 was. So that's n by r1 r2 in a 2 pi times x1 times 2 pi r2 okay so 2 pi r2 2 pi r2 cancels is this clear okay so what we've concluded is that this holonomy as a function of x1 is uh, equal to n x1 by r1. This tells us that x2 tilde in the t-dual circle is equal to this holonomy n x1 by r1. The integral is over x2. It's a, an integral of a one form. You know, once I've told you that it's A2, mm. you're never allowed to integrate over anything else. Yeah, just to consider the setup, we have uh, a flux in a torus, and we are compactifying one of the uh, directions, and we are t-dualizing one of, one the, of the directions. One of the We're t-dualizing the x2 direction, two direction. Mm. in the setup that I set. And that's why x1 is taken to be constant. 
Yeah, exactly. We're doing the t-duality just in x2. We're not doing a t-duality in x1. So just x1 by x1, we're doing the t-duality. Okay? And we have this beautiful relationship that told us what x2 tilde was in terms of the holonomy of A in the x2 direction as a function of x1. Okay? That gave us this, working it out, we got this math, x2 tilde is n x1 by r1. This r tilde, oh, it's it's there. Uh, r2 tilde, thank you. Mm. R2 tilde, thank you, is there. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't have been dimensionally correct at this. Okay. We had this trick in my college. When a lecture was very boring, we wanted to slow the professor down. We would say, sir, the dimensions don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> complicated form. <problem. laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, <laughs> in India, they didn't match. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So, 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 so here we go. Um, now, does this formula make sense? See, if this formula is made, made oh, first, what does it mean first? Now, originally, let's say we started with a D2 brain because it was extended around the 1, 2 directions. What's happening in the other directions doesn't matter. But let's suppose it was a D2 brain. Only extend in the 1, 2 directions, localized in the other. Now, after teriorizing the 2 direction, what we get is a 1 brain because it is localized in the 2 direction. But localized where? At x2 tilde, which is now a function of x1. So let's draw it. Okay, this is the two tilde direction, this is the one direction. At x1 equals 0, x2 tilde is 0. But what is it at x1 equals uh, uh, 2 pi r1? 2 pi r1. x1 equals 2 pi r1, what we get? We get n r2 tilde, 2 pi r2 tilde. What does this mean? What this means is that this guy, for instance, when n is equal to 1, what does it mean? It's gone like this. Yeah. For n is equal to 2, what does it mean? It's gone like this. Yeah. For n is equal to n, what does it mean? It's gone like this, yeah. like this, yeah. like this, like this. Exactly. Yeah. It's wound around the circle n times and come back to itself. The fact that the flux was quantized ensures that this one brain came back to itself. Otherwise, it would make no sense. Okay? So, now what this is, it's a very simple configuration. It's just a D1 brain. Wrapping one circle n times. n times. Exactly. Uh, wrapping the two, uh, two uh, circle n times. Wrapping the two circle. Two circle n times. Uh, the two circle n times, exactly. Now, what is the action for this configuration? Okay, that's the question we're going to ask. But the action for this configuration now is very simple because we've already, now, now you see, the earlier configuration is complicated because it had a field strength. But here, there's no field strength. Because the gauge field has been trivialized into position. So this is pure geometry. So the action for this configuration is purely the length of the D1 brain. Okay? Now the length we can compute, right? It's Pythagoras' theorem. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay? So it's 2 pi r2 times n, the whole thing squared. Right? Because it's gone n times around the r2 direction. Plus uh, 2 pi r1, the whole thing squared. That's what this, this action is. Now, claim this action is exactly what we would get from this action. But the actions should agree. We've got one configuration, same configuration. We've got the same configuration in two different uh, duality frames. Claim the action here is basically, uh, so we should be careful because this is R tilde, R2 tilde. 
the action should agree. This is what forces this form of the, uh, of, of this F business. Okay, let me show you at least roughly how, how it's going to agree. Okay, so first, this guy is with a T1. Because now it's a one brain. This should be equal to T2 times, now this is what? Um, let us work with, uh, uh, let's say that we work with x1, x2 coordinates as we've been doing. Okay, so then in, in these coordinates, and let's say that the um, length of the coordinates are, are the length of the circles are 2 pi r1, 2 pi r2. Okay, so um, this guy is 1, 1, that's g. Okay, what is f? Well, we have it there, right? In this standard coordinate, f was this. Okay, so this was uh, n by r1, r2, 2 pi minus n by r1, r2, 2 pi. Uh, ah, and then this 2 pi alpha prime, yes. So let's get rid of the 2 pi's and we've got alpha prime, alpha prime. That's the matrix that we have here. Now we're supposed to take determinant. The determinant is 1 plus this square. So we get square root of 1 plus alpha prime squared n squared uh, r1 squared r2 squared. But and alpha. We can uh, read up the r because it's t12, the r2 will die in. Exactly. Uh, alpha prime squared by r2 squared yeah. is uh, r, r1 tilde squared. R2 tilde, r2 tilde squared. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, so this is T2 times this. Yeah. So the now, relative coefficients all match up and we can fix, fix the relationship. In terms of inter, in terms of exactly. So now what we want is, uh, uh, and then of course this had to be, this was, the, but then we also had to do the integral over the area. Okay, so we get an uh, 2 pi r1 times 2 pi r2. Here we've already done all integrals. It was just the length, right? So these two have to be equal. Okay, now let's get the same factor here. So this was our, so we get 2 pi. Um, you can take the second term common, then it will match. What? Yeah, 2 pi, r, let's, uh, you can take 2 pi r1 out. Uh, ah, yes, r1 exactly, exactly, 2 pi r1 out. So we get t1 times 2 pi r1 times square root of uh, <coughs> 1 plus uh, uh, r2 tilde squared n squared by r1 squared yes. squared. This should be equal to 2 pi r1 and 2 t2. 2 pi r1. Yes, we'll cancel the 2 pi r1 pi r1s. R1. Times t2 times 2 pi r2 times the same square root. Yeah. So how does this match? 2 pi r1 cancels 2 pi r1. Square root cancels square root. And then this match is provided t1 and t2 are related by a factor of 2 pi r2. Now is it reasonable that t1 and t2 are related by a factor of 2 pi r2? Well, it's reasonable. It's reasonable, though um, there is also the question of what happens to this string coupling uh, when we do t-duality. So I should be a bit more careful. There was this. Okay, so it was really t1 by g, and this was t2 by g 
tilde. Okay. So now, before we can conclude anything about the relationship between T1 and T2, we have to first figure out the relationship between uh, between G and G tilde. Okay. So let's first figure out the relationship between G and G tilde. For that, we go back to closed strings. Actually, I should have told you about this, but we were discussing closed strings, but I forgot. So, uh, but that's okay. We can figure it out now. How do you figure out the relationship between G and G tilde? We just think of it from the point of view of space-time. You see, in space-time, the space-time effective action, like the Einstein action or whatever, uh, has a factor of 1 by G squared times stuff, alpha prime to the 4 and 10 dimensions or whatever, alpha prime to whatever in, in 26 times 24. <laughs> 12, okay, <laughs> okay, but uh, fine, whatever, that's not important. Okay, and now suppose I've got a circle. There's one of the directions that's the circle. This, if I take this description and I go down to 25 dimensions, I got some effective 25 dimensional theory. The effective coupling constant of that 25-dimensional uh, 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 theory, the effect of Newton constant, for instance, yeah. has to be same on both sides of the description. You know, what's happening on the circle, you've got different descriptions of. Flat space is flat space. Yeah. Okay? So on this, yeah. on this side, we had 2 pi r1 times g square. On this side, it's 2 pi r1 tilde. Let's call this r2 because we were doing it. To tilde over g, g, tilde g tilde square. And r2 tilde is alpha prime. Exactly. Uh, over r2. <coughs> exactly. So we get the, uh, the, uh, the relationship g by g tilde is equal to r2 by r2 tilde um, g by uh, square root of r2 by r2 tilde, which you can write if you want, as you as Upman you just said, as R2 squared divided by R2, 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 R2 square root alpha prime. Yes. Okay? So now we plug this in. Okay? Now we now 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 we do we, we do this. So what we have here is T. 1 by g is equal to t2 by uh, t1 is equal to t2 g by g tilde, which was um, r2 over r2 is not square good. Root. Yeah, yeah, I've done something wrong. <laughs> it's gone the other. Two pi's are good. Two pi's are needed. We, we, I j with the right answer is 2 pi square root alpha prime somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yes, so <laughs> <laughs> Actually, g square should appear upstairs. Or when it's e to the minus 2 pi, is it? Or yeah, e to the minus 2 pi, which is 1 by g square. No. Yeah. Uh, so that's 2 pi r2 by g square is 2 pi r2 tilde by g tilde square. That's fine, I think. Um, and therefore, R2 by R2 tilde is G by G tilde. Ah, but the thing is, the thing is that we, what I called here was G tilde. Because G tilde is after T dualization. <laughs> this is G. Before T dualization was G, after was G tilde. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> Sorry. So where were we? T1 is equal to T2 into G tilde over G. Into G tilde over G in a 2 pi R2. But G tilde over G is square root alpha prime over R2. Uh, square root alpha prime over R2. And therefore T1 is equal to square root 2 pi square root alpha prime. Now, 
this, this sounds good. This sounds good because you see the tension of a brain is an intrinsic quantity. Shouldn't depend on which circle you compactify it on. So the relationship should depend on some R's. The fact that the R's have cancelled uh, is very nice. Okay. The fact that we had a square root alpha prime was just dimensional analysis. Right, because we had one addition, uh, T2 has one additional factor of uh, uh, dx. And therefore, its tension should have one additional factor of mass dimension. Mm. So that's this extra factor of, if you wrote two, T2 in terms of T1, there'd be one over, one over alpha prime, so an extra factor of mass dimension. Yeah. Okay, and the T2s are not, were not needed by anything, but it's a calculation. We get T2 out. Okay, so we find that T P can be written as, let's say T zero into uh, two pi square root alpha prime to the power P. And by the way, of course, everything I've done relates T three to T two as well, and you can do it twice. So it's just that every time you reduce a dimension, hmm. you get an extra factor of one over two pi square root alpha prime. Okay. So once we make this identification, once we make this identification, we have more or less checked that this is the correct action, as, at least as far as f is concerned. By the way, just to get this, this p dimension right, we could have switched off f and just match the actions on the two sides. Right? We get volume on one side, is volume on the other side. Yeah. But the two volumes are not the same. But the two string couplings are also not the same. It's the same calculation except you wouldn't have had the square root. I just did it all in one shot. We could have done it in two steps. Okay? So we've justified this term appearing in the action. It's just a consequence of t-duality. Okay. Now, this helps us understand wh how seriously we should take this action. Because you see, what we got, where we got this from was from the from the from the formula that this was just the length okay and that was correct for straight d1 brains wiggly things move in time will not be static complicated situation but straight guys are solutions to the equations of motion so everything we did was really correct okay so this is 100% correct for constant field strength because it's constant field strengths that have a linear, a2 linear and a1, and therefore map to straight lines. But if you had some field strength that was varying, then this action would receive corrections. So there will be plus order del f. Okay? So the way to think of the determinant is also nonlinear. That is not uh, is is nonlinear. And it's correctly nonlinear. The nonlinearity, correct, was Pythagoras' theorem. Right? Pythagoras' theorem is, is nonlinear. So you are saying up to first order, this nonlinearity is the correct one. I am saying that you up to every, yes, exactly. Ignoring terms that are derivatives of f, this nonlinearity is not approximate, it's exact. Okay? Can it be regarded as some low energy effective action? action where f is treated as a zero derivative field? It's treated in derivative expansions. Derivatives of g are not considered. Yeah. Curvatures are not considered. Mm. Derivatives of b are not considered, and derivatives of f are not considered. So treated in derivative expansion, giving f dimension zero, as far as the derivative counting goes. This is exact. It's exact as zero order in the derivative. Where a cannot come. What? Like where a cannot come. This is the first term. In the it's the first term, but you might. Yeah, that you got all orders in F yeah. is quite something, right? And normally when we do field theory, we get F square bus. Here, we there's no restriction on number of powers of F. The restriction is on number of derivatives of, number of, derivatives of F. Okay, then the final question that you might ask, um, the final question that you might ask is, um, what about this B here? Now, I don't know if any of you remember, um, but uh, 
Oh, of course, of course, uh, definitely corrections. For instance, uh, this thing, uh, um, we can look at four photo, uh, two, photo, uh, two to two photon scattering, which is a calculation we didn't quite do, but I told you about the answer for the bosonic theory. And that gets complicated corrections, which will be captured from you. Yeah, so it's all only right for what it's supposed to be right for. Okay, and things are a bit better in the supersymmetric theory. Uh, because there's some supersymmetry constraints we get to. But, uh, but still, there are corrections. Okay, now the last thing I wanted to say uh, was the following. What about this B business here? Now look. Look at how B couples to a closed string. The coupling to of B to a closed string was simply B integrated over the world volume of the closed string. World, yeah, world sheet. I think we've written it differently <coughs> before. We wrote it as, we probably wrote it as D2 sigma, epsilon alpha, beta, beta, beta del alpha, alpha x, x, x mu, del al beta, x mu, mu b, mu, b mu, mu nu. But all this is saying is restrict B as a form onto the world sheet and integrate. Yeah. This is a very complicated way of saying this nice thing. <laughs> okay? Now, B integrated over that had this nice gauge invariance. You remember that uh, B uh, going to B plus D zeta, where zeta is a one form was a gauge invariance of string theory. Where did that come from? It just came from the fact that if I've got a closed <laughs> string and I do db, uh, sorry, I do b, if b is d zeta, then by Stokes theorem I get zero. Right, so, so it's manifest from the form that the, uh, the string theory couples to this b field that b goes to d, uh, b plus d zeta is an invariance of the theory. Okay, but now what happens when you've got uh, open strings? There be boundary to the exactly. Now we've got a world sheet with a boundary. Yeah. Some large gauge transformation. So under B goes to B plus D zeta, this world sheet action doesn't go to zero, but it goes to integral of, of zeta. Where zeta is one form now integrated over the, the boundary. The boundary. <coughs> but remember that string theory also had a separate coupling. On the boundary, the actual coupling with an open with the boundary is integral b over the well over the over the bulk of the well sheet plus integral a. Hmm. Right? On the boundary. On the boundary. So now, once again, we can restore this gauge. You know, gauge invariances are sort of sacred. You don't want to get rid of space-time gauge. We can restore this gauge invariance. If B goes to B plus D zeta, and A goes, goes to A minus zeta, then the whole thing is invariant. And that is the correct gauge invariance in the presence of, in the presence of boundaries when we've got open strings. So this tells you that the true invariance, the true gauge invariance of, of, you know, in the bulk is B goes to B plus D zeta and A goes to A plus zeta. Okay. But now how do we write down terms that are invariant under both of these? And there's some, okay. How do we write down terms that are invariant under both of these? Okay. Uh, we write down terms that are invariant over both of these simply by uh, by noticing that if A goes to A plus zeta, then the field strength corresponding to A is D zeta. Therefore, B plus F is a gauge invariant. 
Now, uh, the only problem is that this would have been the natural thing to do. But what people actually do is write 2 pi alpha prime. So it's B by 2 pi alpha prime plus F. That is the actual gauge invariant. Or equivalently, B plus 2 pi alpha prime F, that is the gauge invariant. So if we found that F appears with a 2 pi alpha prime, completely from general principle, it had better be that B also appears in the same combination. Any scatter, string scattering calculation you do cannot distinguish, cannot make a difference between turning on a B and turning on an F. It's just Stokes' theorem on the well sheet. It's just the same thing. Right? It's just two different ways of writing the same well sheet action by integration by paths. Okay? And therefore, since we've argued the F had to be there, the B has also, also got to be here. That's it. Okay? So everything about this effective action we've argued, except for this quantity T0. Okay? Now you might think, who cares? T0 something. Uh, but we care. And you know, T0 takes a value in the bosonic string that's something. But it's a corresponding value in the superstring is something very, very special. I don't know if you know the story, but Polchinski, you know, invented these D brains. I don't know exactly when, 1989, 1990. And uh, is it 1994, 1995? 95 was the deep brain revolution. Right. That uh, he realized that these should be ident that these things were charged under the Ramon Ramon gauge field. This was not something completely obvious. And then realized, computed the tension, and realized that they had, they were BPS objects that could, should be identified with the supergravity solutions, which were previously known, which were called P brains. And these are real, genuine black hole type solutions in the problem in the theory, um, fit with the idea of duality. This was a big deal. Okay. But uh, uh, between, uh, betw between 1989 and 1995, I believe Pulchinski's paper had three or four, four citations. <laughs> 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 to some conformal field theory business, messing around with boundary condition. <laughs> Nobody cared about it. Yeah. So, so uh, but the key to people taking this seriously was this computation of the tension, which turned out to map to give you objects that were needed to be present because by string duality. Okay, so the fact that these were there and had the right tension was somehow the key. Also, that they had Ramon Ramon, charged under the Ramon Ramon gauge field. Okay, so in the next lecture, I'm going to have to stop now. But in the next lecture, we will uh, uh, we will discuss the computation of the uh, uh, the computation of this the tension of the D brain and the bosonic string. Subsequent lectures then will be basically wholly devoted to the superstring. We have to do some catching up on the Fermi. Yeah, I have one question. Yes. So this, you, know, you said this, uh, we can trade B for A for N for uh, for B or the Y to that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, so as far as the string scattering is concerned, however, uh, there's the uh, the D B, which mm -hmm. is H, that's a gauge invariant object, and that's uh, something physical. So we uh, can't see the H uh, mu nu rho. By string scattering, I mean that's uh, if we can't just set B two uh, completely gauge away B, right? No, we can't set. You see, no, absolutely right. We can't we can't completely gauge away B. But what is what is true is that we can trade the pure gauge part of B for F. Okay. So more precisely, every time B appears, yeah. it has to appear in the combination B plus two pi alpha prime F. Now, F is something that lives on the world volume, yeah. and B is something everywhere. Hmm. So as you said, you, it, it's not like you're getting rid of B everywhere by this F. Huh. But if there is an appearance of an F, there has to be an appearance of a B. Hmm. And these two always appear in this combination. Hmm. OK, great. Excellent. Uh, uh, excellent, excellent, excellent. Any other questions? OK, so next time we will do our D-brain uh, tension computation. And then we will devote ourselves to the superstring a little more seriously. We'll try to get more intuitions on superstring mm -hmm. uh, in various ways. <laughs>